Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. My name is Rahul, and in this lecture, we are going to be going through the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis. This is a very important USMLE concept. There are many test questions that stem from DKA, the pathophysiology, the treatment, the endocrine elements, as well as even the biochemistry elements. I first off want to say that I was inspired by an amazing Reddit diagram to essentially make this lecture, and I hope that you kind of garner the relevant pathophysiology as well as USMLE points. So let's kind of get into it. First off, special shout out to Nicholas Curie who posted this on Reddit, and I'm going to go through some important biochemical processes using this image. Now, before we get started in the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis, I want to actually introduce some major settings as to which each of these biochemical processes are going to occur. Number one, we're going to be talking about the adipocyte. Remember that the adipocyte stores triacylglycerides, and triacylglycerides are made up of a glycerol backbone as well as free fatty acids. The other setting is going to be in the liver. And in the liver, you're going to have many biochemical processes, namely gluconeogenesis, remember glycogenolysis occurs there, beta oxidation of fatty acids occur he occurs here, as well as energy production and ketone body synthesis. Now, another element that we need to look at before we go into the pathophysiology are, is this concept of counter-regulatory hormones. Now remember, your counter-regulatory hormones are going to be epinephrine, cortisol, and glucagon. These are kind of your stress hormones. The other hormones that I would add to this list are going to be norepinephrine as well as growth hormone. These are all those catabolic stress hormones. Now, when you're thinking about the pathophysiology of diabetic ketoacidosis, I want you to focus on here that there is a complete absence of insulin. And why is there an absence of insulin? Well, from a pathologic standpoint, it is usually due to lymphocytic infiltration of the beta pancreatic cell. That's very important for you to recognize, especially on microscopic pathology. Well, because you don't have that insulin, I want you to also think about the fact that the tissues are going to be starved of glucose. Remember that insulin is very important in mediating GLUT4 getting upregulated and bringing the glucose into the cell, especially at the level of the skeletal muscle. So now that you don't have that GLUT4 mediated glucose transport, your tissues are starved of glucose, so they can't make any energy, and thus they upregulate these counterregulatory hormones, epinephrine, cortisol, glucagon. Now when these hormones are going to get upregulated, they're going to activate, at the level of the adipocyte, hormone-sensitive lipase. So the concept is, is that counter-regulatory hormones upregulate hormone-sensitive lipase. So what happens now? Well, now the triacylglyceride breaks down into glycerol and free fatty acids. Let's take each one of these individually. When the glycerol is going to be broken down, it's actually going to be plugged into gluconeogenesis, especially because you have elevated amount of glucagon, that's going to upregulate gluconeogenesis and you're going to make excess glucose. Again, why are you making this excess glucose? Because your tissues are starved of glucose. The high amount of glucose actually compounds your problem in diabetic ketoacidosis. This glycerol 3 phosphate moiety is part of gluconeogenesis and thus you end up getting the final product of gluconeogenesis being glucose. Remember, glucagon also stimulates gluconeogenesis, but it also stimulates glycogenolysis, not pictured in this diagram, but the downstream effect is the same, high amounts of glucose. Remember that if you have excess gluconeogenesis, you're not only going to have high glucose, but you're going to deplete oxaloacetate. And as a result, your TCA is going to start to become very dysfunctional. So we talked about the glycerol effect. Now, what about the free fatty acids? Well, remember, your body is going to need some element of energy. And the body is going to get that energy via beta oxidation of free fatty acids. 
Now, remember, beta oxidation of free fatty acids is going to involve taking a fatty acid molecule, say an even chain fatty acid molecule, and taking two carbons and throwing it into TCA, taking two carbons and throwing it into TCA. Now, what are those two carbons known as? Well, those two carbons are known as acetyl-CoA. And so, yes, acetyl-CoA is going to fuel the TCA cycle. However, when you don't have good oxaloacetate and or you are going to flood the TCA with excess acetyl-CoA, you are going to shut down the TCA because the TCA can't just keep spinning and spinning and spinning. It's overwhelmed by so much acetyl-CoA. So that excess acetyl-CoA then shifts into ketone body synthesis, and that excess amount of ketone body synthesis gives you that anion gap metabolic acidosis that you see in diabetic ketoacidosis. Remember that in diabetic ketoacidosis, you are going to have beta-hydroxybutyrate, which causes you to have the anion gap metabolic acidosis, as well as that fruity breath, that acetone um, breath that you are going to uh, see in your vignettes. So speaking of vignettes, let's kind of recap this pathophysiology with some active recall vignettes. A 12-year-old lethargic boy presents with nausea and abdominal pain after a URI. Remember, URI is usually going to be a trigger for diabetic ketoacidosis. He's been wetting the bed and has abdominal pain. This wetting the bed is actually really important because one of the causes of secondary enuresis is going to be hyperglycemia. He's also been having excessive thirst, so polydipsia, and elevated amounts of glucose. The patient is dehydrated and urine dipstick is positive for ketones. Well, this is going to be diabetic ketoacidosis and the metabolic abnormality is that anion gap metabolic acidosis. Remember that the presence of ketones, specifically beta-hydroxybutyrate, can contribute to this and the patho pathophysiology of DKA is autoimmune destruction of the beta pancreatic cell, no insulin, high stress hormones, high free fatty acids, and thus ketones. So to compensate for this underlying acidosis, the lungs are going to kick in and give you this deep labored breathing, which is that Kussmaul breathing. Now, what's important about their potassium? Remember that in diabetic ketoacidosis, you are going to have serum potassium that may be elevated, but their total body potassium may be low. Let's go into this concept. When you are thinking about hyperkalemia in diabetic ketoacidosis, here are some mechanisms. The first mechanism is going to be a lack of insulin. Remember that insulin is kind of like a beta agonist. It's going to push potassium into cells. If you don't have good insulin, you're not going to be able to push potassium into cells and thus you can become hyperkalemic. Another cause is going to be a transcellular shift. Now remember that at the level of your cellular membrane, you have a hydrogen potassium exchanger. And when the cell is going to be in a matrix that has a lot of H+, i.e. acidosis, all of that H plus is going to go into the cell, and in order to maintain electrochemical neutrality, you're going to have the potassium actually bust out. And that's actually really important that acidosis causes you to become hyperkalemic. Now, what about the mechanisms contributing to hypokalemia? Well, the short of all of this is that you're peeing out your potassium. How and why? Well, remember that the how is that you are dehydrated and RAS is going to kick in. Now remember, RAS is going to bring in sodium and make you pee out hydrogen in order to curtail your acidosis as well as potassium. So when RAS is upregulated, you're gonna pee out potassium. That contributes to total body potassium being low. The other element is that you have increased amounts of glomerular transit, i.e. There is excess amount of glucose that's filtered through your glomerulus and that is flowing through your nephron. That increased amounts of flow wastes your potassium even more. So in summary, hyperkalemia with total body potassium being low, very high yield for us to know.
The last thing that I want to kind of tie in here is insulin. When you're thinking about insulin, remember that we talked about that insulin is a agent that is needed for GLUT4 mediated transport. And this is going to be related to facilitated diffusion, using a protein carrier to bring substances across a concentration gradient. What we also have to understand is how insulin is released. Remember that insulin is going to be released when there's high glucose in the beta pancreatic cell. That high glucose is acted by glucokinase from glycolysis, and thus, because you have high amount of glycolysis, you have a high ATP to ADP ratio that closes a potassium sensitive ATP, or excuse me, a ATP sensitive potassium channel. What that closure of the ATP sensitive potassium channel does is it depolarizes the inner membrane of the beta pancreatic cell, causing a differential in charge and thus opening a voltage gated calcium channel. Now, when that voltage gated calcium channel opens, you are actually going to release small packets of insulin. And that's extremely high yield that when you have calcium come in, insulin is then going to be released with endogenous C peptide. So there are questions which relate to factitious insulin administration in which you have a high insulin but a low C peptide, which means that it is an exogenous etiology is contributing to the hyperinsulinemia. And a nice pharmacological tie-in here is that oral sulfonylureas increase endogenous insulin by closing the ATP-sensitive potassium channel. So in summary, we covered the pathophysiology of DKA, know the presentation, know the potassium abnormality, and integrate insulin as one of your endocrine tie-ins. I hope that this was helpful, and thanks again to Reddit for inspiring this wonderful concept and review.